All right, all right. We're revisiting this right here. The founder of evil angelicalism was a white supremacist, Jonathan Edwards. Left a horror history that his religion tried to conceal. My brother, give thanks for your patience, Ross Seymour, man. I know we had did this before, you know what I mean? But technical, technical, we got to get this out right here. So, bro, at will, you know... You know, bring forth a little vibes in. We just vibes in here. Yes, sir. Give thanks. Yes, we just vibes in, holding our reasoning, and these um, evil angels, as you know, <laughs> like as the brother said. And uh, we have Mr. Jonathan Edwards here. He said the founder of evangelicalism was a white supremacist. Jonathan Edwards left a horror history. That his religion tried to conceal, like the brother just said. Now, in in 1997, a historian at Yale University published a startling paper. In the archives of Jonathan Edwards, he found a letter defending slavery. Hmm. Now, this guy is called Kenneth P. Min. Minkimas, Minkima, Kenneth P. Minkima. Now his paper said Jonathan Edwards on slavery mm. and the slave trade revealed his secret, the religion mm. had kept for centuries about man often called mm. the father of evangelicalism. Satan. <laughs> <laughs> this is their father, people. This is their no, father. Jonathan Edwards. He lived from 1703 to 1758. Known for his famous sermon, Sinner in the Hands of an Angry God. Fire. Set mm. the tone for the faith going forward. His fiery speech stimulated the Great Awakening that rescued conservative Christianity in America. Mm. He's, he's been a personal inspiration to many in evangelical pastors and has been discussed often by modern church leaders like John Piper, as in Piper's 2006 book, God's Passion for His Glory, Living the vision of Jonathan Edwards. Mm. Oh, God. I checked a, he wanted to say he checked a shelf full of biographies of, of Edwards. There is nothing about his slave owning, his views on race, or even about slavery at all. A standard reference work, Alexander V. G. Allen, Allen's 1889 biography, Jonathan Edwards, Volgari suggests that Edwards was anti-slavery, mm. which we know is not true. La, 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 la. Father of lies. Go ahead. Mm. Next point. Jonathan Edwards was a slave owner, had to be on the record. His will mm. listed his slaves. Did that? His will. Mm. Listed his slaves. So after after he dead, he's uh, uh, still regulating black lives. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm, 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 mm. The biographers had to have known. In eighteen fifty, a well known minister wrote that Edwards left behind him in a manuscript an essay on the slave trade. Edwards' essay on slavery had been used apparently to justify Southern slavery leading up to the Civil War, mm. then it vanished. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> it vanished. It just disappeared. It vanished. It pulled a Houdini. Mm. But there is more Houdini because he said, but, in, but the historians at Yale University found a few things like a receipt for a slave, <laughs> a teenage girl named Venus, who Edwards had personally purchased. 
Mm. Personally. You heard that, that people? A receipt. Not saying nobody. A receipt. Okay. Receipt. Receipts, right? People talk about receipts. Receipt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That he personally purchased. The document was published in 1995 in a giant and Edwards reader. It it must have been startling for the historians finding a Christian hero had owned slaves. It was intermixed with his theology. Mm -hmm. the, re uh, like the receipt of Venus had two of Edward's sermon written on the back. Mm. The editor downplayed the news. His slave owning, they informed, is a reminder of Edward's place in time. Mm. That's what that's what they wanted to phrase it. Mm. His place in so so what they're trying to say there, it wasn't really him. It was just because there was slavery going on back then. So he also was like the people of his time. But what the truth is is that he was a big proponent. He he was a protagonist of the whole thing. He was defending it and then claiming to be a so called man of God. You know what I mean? A man of God and a, and 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 a so called Christian. All right, but but go on, go on, my brother. Go on. You, but good segue, good segue. It says then Min Kama Min he said then Min Kema found Edwards had advocate for slavery. Oh word. Mm. A draft of a letter written around seventeen thirty eight had Edwards been clear clearly he hardcore advocate for slavery. Hardcore. Mm. He had he at he attacked abolitionists. Mm -mm. He attacked abolitionists. He made mockery of people who denounced owning slavery and said that everyone was involved in slavery, hmm. like it or not. Mm. Mm. So he just went along with uh, it was going on. So his Christian, his Christian, whatever, man, go on, go on, man, go on, go on, go on. Let's get this. Another out. local pastor had been under fire from his congregation for slave owning. Edwards defended the man, saying those criticizing him were out to make disturbance mm. and raise uneasiness amongst people against their own minister to the great wounding of religion. Hmm. <laughs> great wounding of religion. Great wounding of religion. Next bullet point. This was a different Edwards than evangelicalism had said. You see, they're trying to shift. No, they're trying to shift. Oh, different. This was different. Yeah, they're trying to shift. You know, they're trying to play um, like a beat and switch. Your six four nine. Mm. In two thousand two, <laughs> Minkama published a follow up paper, Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards' defense on slavery. In two thousand three, a new biography, George M. Madden's Jonathan Edwards, a life had a little more. After buying Venus, he bought Titus, then Joseph, mm. and Sue, mm -mm. And, and Joab, and Rose, who married and had sons, Joseph, did work in the Edwards house while he was a while he was in his studies creating a theological system that would be used to justify the slave trade for the next century. Mm. So this is a very important person in this whole slavery and enslavement thing, but they never talk about this. This is like the first time really hearing 
about this this man and this man is very big in white christianity american so-called american christianity you know i think it's because of people like this why there's a lot of you know people who don't deal with the so-called bible or who don't deal with christianity because when you see the hypocrisy you know the bold and blatant in your face hypocrisy even the people that beat him up as father you know, as father of um, American Christianity, they don't even touch on this. They don't. They don't. They don't even go into this. Or they try to do what they, what you just said that they do. They 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 kind of mixed it up. Yeah, I'll be trying to switch gears. Yeah. Six four nine. Yeah, yeah. This is not really. This is a different Jonathan Edwards. Like like the Jekyll and Hyde, Doctor Jekyll, Jonathan Edwards, and Mister Hyde. But what they do is they hide who this person that they worship as their founding father of white American Christianity. He's responsible for this counterfeit Christianity. Many shall come, you know, many shall come in my name and say they are Christ. He's a prime example of ones that was talking about being Christian. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Let's, 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 let's get the receipt. Read the last, the, the last sentence again. You say, while he was in his studies, creating a theological system that would be used to justify slavery to justify the slave trade for the next century next century that's a hundred years people for the next hundred years one mm. one man sitting in the, one man sitting in the house in his study planning these kind of things yeah. and his writing will be so important that it will go on for another hundred years yeah. to justify wickedness he mm. says so he says so long as slaves he, he maintained were purchased legally legally oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> humanely <laughs> humanely oh wow <laughs> treated and every effort was made to convert them to christianity <laughs> it was all fine Mm. Mm. Such mm. details were offered only by secular scholars as religion was silent. Mm. Like you just said, they ain't, they ain't touching on this a thing at all. It's like, it's like hot, hot lava. See no evil, right? See no evil. Hear no he evil, right? Speak no evil. <laughs> yeah, speak no evil. Don't see no evil. Don't hear no evil. All right. And this is, this is, you know, when you brought this forward before, I might have heard his name before, but probably I got a lot of that sleight of hand too. You know what I mean? Where they try to make him, because I'm, I'm looking at some people can see on the screen just going over some searches so people can see some of the stuff that's out there on this guy. And it seems as though. They're trying to like justify, you know, that he is some sort of like he he went from being a slave, a slaver to an abolitionist. You know, they're putting out a lot of false narratives. You know what I mean? Because he is like the founding father of this white Christianity doctrine that really has nothing to do with what the Bible really and truly says, but this is their own version. He's like the he's like the father of this this white Christianity. You know, this white Christianity, he's the father of it. Like the it's like trying to turn the arson into the fireman. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They burn down the house and they come in, you know, talking about better fire policy. You know, this this Jonathan Edwards right here. Um, yeah, I noticed. Yeah, that part you want coming up just now. That part you want coming up in, in just after this one here. We got one bullet point. The bullet point after that one is the one that you, that you want to touch on, really. I got a couple more after that, but then we get to that one there. The next one here says, um, Edwards knew slave owning was contrary to Christian theology. Minkama noticed a sermon had been edited prior to being delivered. Edwards initially wrote that 
when the Messiah came, he should proclaim a universal liberty to all servants, slaves, captives, vessel, and imprisoned or condemned persons. Mm. But then Edwards deleted the word slaves. Mm. So <laughs> wait, 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 wait. He found some of the this guy's original writing. Yes. And like where he made his notes. Yes. And he struck out the word slave. slave. So when Christ comes and his theology is to liberate everybody. Everybody except... but the slaves. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and that and this is the guy that they call their their great like father of um what American evangelicalism. In other words, he is the father of American so all the you hear about the evangelicals. You know, there's a lot of talk about evangelical. He is the father of it. You know when they say that the devil's a liar and the father of it? Well, this Jonathan Edwards in real time, in the real world, he is the father of this hypocritical white white Anglo Saxon Protestant Christianity that they call evangelicalism. I wonder how many black so-called evil evangelicals know about this. You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of them that like to follow, you know, follow whatever any white boy come out with. Without really looking at what he's really saying or where did he stand on real moral issues. You know, and for him to write that, that Christ is going to free up everybody, but not the, you know, not the slaves. You know? Then he goes on to say... Uh... That is, that is to say, Edwards altered the Bible's presentation of the Messiah in order to defend American slavery. Mm. Edwards say, 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 say that again. Say that, say that one more time. One, one more time. That is to say, Edwards altered the Bible's presentation of the Messiah mm. in order to defend American slavery. <laughs> They've been editing the Bible's uh, presentation of the Messiah in a lot of ways, but that's an interesting way right there. We already know they did the whitewash, but now it's not just that they changed the pictures and whitewashed it, but they changed the meaning of the gospel. They they changed the whole point of the Messiah. It's a it's another Christ. It's Antichrist. This is this is Antichrist, folks. You know, as strange as it may seem, people look at this guy and say, oh, well, he was just a man of his time. <laughs> it's like, you're going to love this one right here. <laughs> this last paragraph and this thing here before we get to the other one. <laughs> it says, Edwards legalistically defined the term neighbor as in the biblical commandment, love your neighbor to exclude African people, since they were from a country that was geographically remote. Can we read that one again? Hmm. <laughs> geographically remote, like they came from Europe <laughs> that was way over there. Across the same Atlantic, the northern part of the so-called Ethiopic Ocean, Atlantic Ocean. Oh, okay. Read it again. Yeah, read it again. <laughs> It says, Edwards legal, legalistically defined the term neighbor as in the biblical commandment, love your neighbor, to exclude African people since they were from a country that was geographically remote. Hmm. So I wonder how the African Christians should look at people like Edwards. Think about it. They came all the way from Europe, right? All the way from Europe. They came with from Europe to Africa, right? And that's remote, but still, they teach the, they teach the blacks to love them like they're their, their, their neighbor. You know what I mean? And they don't, they didn't even speak their language. Mm. Sin is in the hands of an angry God. That, that's that Yadaba oath. You know that? Remember that Yadaba oath? Yes. The Yadaba oath, that angry God. Notice. Uh, haven't you heard them talk like a lot of these Christians talk about an uh, angry God? A lot of them preach about this angry God. And when I look through the Bible, yeah, it might say that God is angry or he might get angry, whatever, like that. But they say angry God. 
You know what I mean? Angry God. I caught something else that he said. He said that God is some sort of a creature. I thought that was interesting. He said, like, while I was re reading right there, I was trying to catch some stuff, you know, for the vid right here. And he says that God is the highest good of the reasonable creature. The enjoyment of him is our proper and is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied. Now we know when he's saying our, right? Remember, remember the how to make a slave Willie Lynch paper? Right? Yeah. When, when, when they say to the slaves, get our crops. It's not that, that the slaves have part of our ownership. We got to make sure that they don't think when we say our crops, the slaves think it means our, you know, like, like neighbor, like the neighbor point. To go to heaven, now notice what, what Edwards is preaching, to go to heaven fully to enjoy God is infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here. Better than fathers and mothers, husbands, wives, or children, or the company of any or all earthly friends. You know, when I read him here, he sounds just like the T.D. Jakes and just like the the Creflo Dollars and and that and that and that, and that, and that woman. What's her name? Joyce Myers. He, he sounds it's just. A whole bunch of them. It's a whole bunch of them. You know, Christ speak with them when he was talking to my brother Thomas. You know, remember when he tell them, you are um, they have the keys to the kingdom, but they will not enter. And they're doing everything in their power to keep you from getting in there. Yeah, because we're not their neighbor, right? <laughs> we're we're not their neighbor. Come on, remote, please. Geographically. <laughs> and, 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 and check it out. They went to this remote place geographically to bring the Africans, to bring the black people over here. Think about that. Th think about the hypocrisy at every point. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like it's 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 like talking out, you know, like 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 double speak. This is like the serpent. This is the serpent in the garden. This is the modern day serpent in the garden. This is the serpent in the garden. That's yes. the, that the other white folks didn't have the, the, the clear sense. Even many of the historians for what you bring in forward with McKenna, um, Min, Min Kemmer's work right there, how he actually wrote some stuff and then scratched out the black folks. You know what I mean? They actually know that he participated and defended slavery in America, and yet they'll call him like America's great father of evangelicalism, and they'll say that he is the father of American Christianity. That's the point I want once to get. Can you remember when we read this? The, this is the cognitive, cognitive dissonance, whether they call it, because look, look what is look what they're celebrating this weekend here, Columbus Day. They're still celebrating this foolishness. The bank closed. So Columbus. You know, yeah, they still <laughs> celebrating these demons. Columbus. You know? You know? And 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 Christopher Combrocus. You know, <laughs> Combrocus. And they they praise this guy. I, I looked at some of the books and people you can rewind it where we was just going or, or look it up for yourself on Google. And just look at the titles of the books. Look how they praise this guy. But how they say very little. It's only a few scholars like um Minkema and a few others. Remember the other article I think we had went to that was really exposing, you know, the other yeah. side that is well known. Notice this. This is well known to them. Why they praise him as the father of evangelicalism, right? They know that he was a big advocate of slavery and he's the one that kind of set the mold. He set the mold for them. So they praise him on one hand because he's this great Christian evangelical white father and everything but they suppress the fact that he was the one that set them more firmly on the enslavement of black people african and black people as well as having a anti-christ doctrine he has an anti-christ it's clear when he scratched it out anti-christ the part that I don't want to really, uh, really get to it before you get to it, but we're, we're you speaking about with the um, what's the other part about slavery? It's coming up. Yeah, it's, it's coming right now. So um, go to Deuteronomy now. Go to do uh, like like um, like a matter of fact, I think you should read Deuteronomy, like Deuteronomy 15, 12 to eighteen before I read this. Deuteronomy fifteen, twelve to eighteen. Yeah. Okay. What's the key? Uh, what's the key word? You got a key word there? Uh, hold up, hold on. Uh, is it about the the servants the the because it would use bond man okay that god god brought you out of egypt um by night 
Okay, okay. Um sacrifice the Passover. Okay, I'll put Passover, Passover. I'll put broad and Passover right here. And let's go right here. Deuteronomy sixteen, you said? Yeah, Deuteronomy um fifteen. Oh hold up, sorry, I I give you the Rami scripture, hold up. It's fifteen, but I didn't sixteen. Deuteronomy fifteen. Fifteen, I didn't sixteen. I was reading what? um so 16 is 15. Uh, Which verse? I got it. I got the chapter. It's a, the one with um, oil and wine. Oil and wine. Okay. Oil and wine. The poor shall never cease if thy brother be a Hebrew man. Is, is that the one? Oh, okay. And thou shall remember. Is that the one? And thou shall remember fifteen, fifteen. Yeah, ahead. fifteen, fifteen, and fifteen start at twelve. Start at twelve. If one, kill, if, if one, if one of your brothers, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you and has served you for six years, then in the seventh year you should set him free. That okay. one there. Okay. 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 I got that. I got. I got that. Actually, the people could see that first. I had paused it on verse nine, where it says, "Be okay, well, go from nine, then, no, no. Be where you see, no? beware," because because when you was, was trying to get the verse, I read over it. And I know this verse, and when you said that, how he didn't like to to abide. He didn't like the the, the fact that the Bible limited even his his folly about slavery, but he didn't like it. Verse 9 says, Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying the seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother. But remember, they didn't view black people as neighbor, you know what I mean? Therefore, they, didn't, they definitely didn't view them as brother. And thou givest him naught, givest him nothing. What do they give black people besides hell? They gave them nothing. Nothing. And he cried, and and they gave them, they gave black people antichrist, right? And he cried to Yahuwah, to Jehovah against thee, and it be sin to thee. You see, this is the American sin. This, this is this is verse ten. Thou shalt surely give him. The Bible is saying, right? And thine heart shall not be grieved. But we find also in Jonathan Edwards writing about slavery that he was grieved. You know when when he was commanded to release them, you know, why can they have the black people work for six years and then just, you know, let them become part of it, you know? When thou givest to him because that for this thing, Yahuwah thy Elohim shall bless thee in all thy works. Remember that past that said, um, people say, God bless America, no, God curse America. Look what it says, thou shall be blessed in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand to. Verse 11, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore, I command thee, saying, thou shalt open thine hand wide to thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. But remember, Jonathan Edwards had rewrote the whole message of Christ for these white people to exploit other people. So they didn't look at the black man as a brother. Verse 12, and if thy brother... A Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman. Look how strange it is. The the Hebrews, the Hebos. You've seen that before. The Hebos. How many linked up the Hebrews on a lot of those slave posters and everything? The Hebos. They actually had Hebrews, Ebos. They actually had black people from West Africa, the Israelites, Hebrews, right? And if thy brother and Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman be sold to thee and serve thee six years. Six years. Then in the seventh year, thou shalt let him go free from thee. So how did Jonathan Edward and his fellow slavers, white slavers, how long did they have average, on average, uh, a black man or woman enslaved? They had them until they were dead. Until they were dead. And then they took the children till they dead, till they children till they dead, till they children till they dead. What happened to the six years? Six, six, six. Uh-oh. And when thou sendest him out free, whoa, they never did that, right? Mm -hmm. From thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. So if you talk about reparations, you know, there's a bigger reparation than what they 
what they can give and what they will give. Verse 14, thou shall furnish him liberally. Liberally, but what they do, they put the liberals in our community to exploit us. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy wine press. Of that wherewith Yahuwah thy Elohim have blessed thee, thou shalt give to him. But check this. This here was not given to white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Christians. They took it. Think about this for a moment. This was not even speaking really to them. But because they took it as though it's the word of God, notice how they did not fulfill it, right? And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, right? Now, we know this don't apply to them, but it says, And Yahuwah Eloheka redeemeth thee, therefore I command thee this thing. Now, now you have that part, um, sh should I go on with, 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 with see, see, they picked and choose. They picked and choose parts of this. You notice that? They picked and choose parts of this. Like that part, what you talk about with Jonathan Edwards and what verses he didn't like in the Bible? You have that, right? Yeah, I'm going to read that just now. Go ahead. When you finish, do what you're doing. Do what you're doing, and then I'm going to read it. Verse 16. And it shall be, if he say to thee, Oz will not go from thee. You know, that, that's what tickled them. They, they love to hear us talk like that, right? Oz will not go from thee, Masa. Right? Because he loveth thee in thine house. He loveth you in your white Anglo Saxon prize in the house. Because he is well with thee. No, no, no. We would never well with them. But, but this is what they, the lie they told themselves. Verse 17. Then thou shalt take an all. And all is like um, um, marzea in the Hebrew. It's like, it's like an all, like a boring instrument. Something that makes a hole. Right? Something that would make a hole. Right? And thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be thy servant forever. Tell me something. When they when they when they kept black people beyond six years, since they were such good Christians, they were such good white Christians. When they kept the average enslaved black or African person more than six years, did they ever do this? Did they ever put like an earring in his ear? No. Nope. They actually took off the earrings and other jewelry that we had. And also to thy maid servant, thou shalt do likewise. Verse 18, and it shall not seem hard to thee when thou sendest him away free. <laughs> oh, it was very hard for Jonathan Edward. He would write something for the next hundred years. <laughs> you know, going all the way to the civil. It's because of the Jonathan Edwards that there was a civil war. And it's because of these these um, antichrist evil angelists, because of their praising of Jonathan Edwards, is why there's no peace. For he hath been worth a double hired servant to thee in serving these six years. That means that everything they got beyond six years was a curse to them. And Yahuwah Eloheka, Jehovah your Elohim, shall bless thee in all that thou doest. Right? So we're going to pause right here. So even though this was not, this was not given to them, it says, speak to the children of Israel, but the white man, these white men, especially the white Anglo-Saxon prize, and they were liars. They, they were under the strong delusion. When the Bible talks about strong delusion, they believe a strong lie. They came from Europe, from England, from other parts of Northern Europe. And guess what they told themselves? They told themselves that they are the Israelites. They're the spiritual Israelites. They came over here, saw the native people over here that they want to call Indians because of Columbus, right? Columbrock. And they basically said that they were the Canaanites. Why? Because then they would misappropriate the Bible as they did with the so-called slavery. So stop making people believe, make you believe that, oh, the slavery is in the Bible because the word is not even found in the 1611 Bible. The word is found in two places, but they're not even there. It's not, it's not found anywhere in the law that they look to because they use these verses. But it shows how ignorant or willing accomplices were the white folks. You know, I have this meme, are you a real Christian? It has Jonathan Edwards' face here. And it says, how to know. Was Jonathan Edwards a real Christian? Go on, bro. Go, 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 go. Come, come, come in, man. Just to, um, to put a little historical stamp on what you just said, right? In in those days, what is biblical um, law is speaking about? Because what he just read, there was a law, right? In those days, 
if you if you are my master and I'm a so-called slave under your rule for those six years. In those six years, I can get married, have children. My children could go to school with your children, learn and become something in society. I could take my thing or whatever that I work with you. And after six years, you could help me to get my own thing so I could be somebody in society as well. My wife didn't actually have to be a slave. I could marry and not my wife not be a slave. So all these things is, 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 is historical dynamics that has to be put into the story to, you know, to overstand when they were talking about this, this law in, in Deuteronomy, in, mm, like in mm. biblical days, sure, what sure. the context of this servitude and the conditions around it were. It, it was like endangered. Compared to this chattel slavery we had over here, Correct. With these demons. Correct. It, it, it was what they call indentured servant servitude. You know what they did with some white folks. With some of the white folks, they they practice some of those things, like what's about the Hebrew servant. And also, everybody take note when it's about the Hebrew servant, it basically was stipulating what the Hebrews could do to the Hebrews. In other words, there were different levels depends on who you were. That's why I talk about the Hebrew man or the Hebrew woman. And what we just read about the law that the brother brought out right there, that the Hebrew man or the Hebrew woman was like an indentured servant. That means they served for a limited, as you said, six years. And in the seventh year, <coughs> in the seventh year, you let them go free. You know, there was never a seventh year for the enslaved Africans, black people, for the Israelites. There was never a seventh year. But for their own people who they brought over, because sometimes they brought a white person over that could not afford the passage, the ship and everything. And so therefore some white person, you know, one of their brethren would pay for it. So when the white person came over, had to work for them, you know, for X amount of time, but they still was able to be like freed, you know what I mean? And join society as the brother is saying right there. That's what that law is, is speaking about concerning the Hebrews. But what I'm trying to say is that they picked and choose. You know, they picked a verse here. You know, like they do in the churches, where they'll, they'll, they'll choose a verse here, and then the preacher will spin it. You know, he'll remix it. But if you read that verse in context with the rest of the passage in Scripture, and you listen to the preacher's remix, the first thing you'll recognize, if you are sober and sentient, is that it's two different things. He just took the one verse, you know what I'm saying? And he remixed it. You know, but when you read it in context, it's like the brother said, it was where you are part of the society and there's a limitation to your service. And the person who is who is your boss, your brethren, who is your boss for that period of time where you have to kind of like, you know, earn your keep, so to speak, must give to you when you leave him. You, you know what I'm saying? That's why it says if there be a wicked thought, see that there'd be no wicked thought. You know, like, you know, an evil thought in your wicked heart that you're not going to give to your brother. But remember what the brother said about Jonathan Edwards? You know, he already said that they're not even our neighbor. The black folks, the black people are not, either, you know what I mean? We're not even their neighbor. So how much less their brother? Okay, we're we, we, we geographically remote. Because we geographically, you know, that's a good way to say because, because, um, what did Satan say? He says, skin for skin. All that a man have will he give for his life. Think about that. When Satan said in the Job, in the book of Job, skin for skin. That's what Jonathan Edwards was practicing, that Satan shite. Skin for skin. They try to use that the black people were from Africa remote. They came all the way from Europe and other parts of the world. What do you mean? Remote. You, you hear what I'm saying? But it was skin for skin. Man will give all that he has for his life. And Jonathan Edwards and other hypocrites, white Christian hypocrites, to, to, to keep that luxury. Remember when we read about the luxury? The luxury that they enjoyed, you yeah. know, the leisure they had. Jonathan Edwards could sit back and he could philosophize. Well, I'm trying to find that same Like I still have this. Yeah, he could sit back and philosophize. They had a lot of leisure to sit back and write and do all kind of stuff. Why? Right? Because how many black people were working 
more than six years. <laughs> you know, we're, right, we're under bonding. Yeah, I'm mean, longer than six years. Six years. Let me go ahead and touch that so we could um, go on to Exodus. Got the next one will be Exodus. Exodus 21, 20 to 20, 20 to 21. After I read this one in here, you just um, read Deuteronomy 15, 9 to 18. Now it says here, the next bullet point is, Jonathan Edwards, he liked that the Old Testament allowed slavery. He, that he liked that the Old Testament <laughs> allowed slavery according to his, his interpretation and his reading. <laughs> wow. He said, it says here, is, but, but listen what it says here. It says, Israelites mm. could indeed own slaves. Mm. Uh -oh. but, but Edwards didn't seem to like the rules around biblical slavery. Mm. As we read a while ago in Deuteronomy 15, 9 to 18, mm. a slave could only be one for six years then they were to be set free uh -oh. that's on the seventh year uh oh mm. he enlightened jonathan, rules jonathan edwards kept his slaves to his death but but he put them in his will right yes uh -oh. What is it? They didn't say he, he gave them anything, you know. He just said they were in the will. Yeah, yeah, his will. So he could have willed them to somebody else. Not, not you understand? Mm, so mm. don't think because they were in the will that mean they get something. They could have been <laughs> property. That could have been exactly. there was property. Really so was. most likely mm -hmm. he willed them to somebody. Mm. That's why they're in the will because he was giving them. He was willing them. This is part of my property, my assets. You could have these, yeah. Oh, oh, that's what they get. Do what thou wilt. Right? Oh, do what thou wilt. Right? Shall be all of the law. Not what the Bible says. But do what thou wilt. You know? Do what thou wilt. They pass it on to his his kinfolk, his his neighbors. You know what I mean? He, pa he, he passed them on to his neighbors. And it didn't matter how Christian these ones were. You know what I mean? Didn't matter. Didn't matter. That's a, that's a good point right there. That he did not like the the bible uh, uh, how, how they call it again he, he, didn't, he didn't like the regular he said, but he didn't seem to like the rules the rules biblical slavery wow uh, like, uh, like although he he liked that the old testament allowed slavery he liked that he allowed it but he didn't like the rules but he liked the rules mm. so he kept his until he did and then after he did he will them to somebody else so they're still slaves. Oh, that's why he says, that's why he says uh, his preach, his famous preach was sinners in the hand of an angry God. Oh. So, so he knew God, the real God is angry at him. You know, the black God is angry at him because he want to call himself a Christian preacher. But this is their greatest. This is their, this is the best of them. He was the best of them, right? He, 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 he's the best of them. You know, I got this thing right here where it says, uh, how on earth could Christians have, quote, justified slavery? This is Thomas S. Kidd. And they have this thing here. I got to send it to you. It says, Jonathan Edwards is my homeboy. And then they have a black man, you know, that, that black man on his knee, one knee, and his hands shackled. And he's saying, am I not a man and a brother? You, nigga, you're not a neighbor. <laughs> You could not, he can, even if he's living right next, to, even if he's living in Jonathan Edwards' house, he's not a neighbor. Think about that, yo. <laughs> but he didn't like the rules. <laughs> no, no, he ain't done with the rules. He ain't done with the rules at all. Just like Lucifer, right? <laughs> he didn't like. No, he didn't like the rules. He didn't like the, oh, I found it here. Yeah, yeah that was that Jonathan Edwards and his support of slavery. There's, a, there's that article right there. He was. Yeah, he, I think I still have it. He was the one behind the whole original sin. So people who think that original sin is a real biblical teaching, that's Jonathan Edwards. That's Jonathan Edwards stuff, right? His big thing was the doctrine of original sin. You know that claims that all people are born with sin. The doctrine was embraced by Puritans. You know, there was a group of white Christians called Puritan. Why do you think they were so pure? 
right? Because they were white, right? The Puritans, right? Calvinists. The Calvinists are those who say one saves, always saves. They make you believe that, or they tell themselves that if you were saved one time, there's nothing, 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 nothing you can do and lose your salvation. And most other Protestant and Catholic groups, this belief stands in contrast to the belief that humans are inherently good and become sinful at some point. He says, that's what the Bible teach, that human beings, right, we have an inherent goodness in us, right, but choose and become sinful. We're born into sin, into this, you know, like, like imagine a black child born into Jonathan Edwards slavery. Can you imagine that? That's how he became a sinner, because he was born into Jonathan Edwards slavery. <laughs> Oh, you thought it was some other way, right? And then his message, his main message, I, I looked this up before. It says, hey, bro, let me, let me do this right here. I'm going to send this to you on your phone, and I'm going to say, here it is. This was when we was reasoning about it a couple of months ago, right? So you can, like, just, just you, know, you know how you click on it, and you can go to that section right there, right? I just sent it to you. Here it is. So when you click on, when you click on that, It'll take you back to if you scroll back, you'll find the article. There's the yeah, article. Yeah, there. Oh yeah, yeah. Usually, what I do, I, I slide it close. Use it like I and I reopen the app. Sometimes. Okay, you know. Yeah. Um, but check this out. His main message. Remember, this is the big papa. He is the father of evil angelism, Anglo-Saxon Protestantism. Evil angelicalism. They, they 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 say he's a part of the great awakening. The great awakening is that they could just defy what the Bible said and still make themselves believe that they were good Christians or something. His aim was to teach his listeners about the horrors of hell. That's another thing when you start to check out their doctrine. Their doctrine is very like gothic. It's it's like very dark. It's like kind of morbid. You know what I'm saying? About the horrors of hell, the dangers of sin. And the terrors of being lost. This is what most people believe it's all about. When it comes down to the Bible and, and Christianity, so to speak. Edwards described the position of those who do not follow Christ's urgent call to receive forgiveness. <laughs> no, no, no forgiveness for you. Wait, wait, wait. wait. He, he never talked about repentance or stop doing your sin. Stop doing the uckery like slavery. He's not talking about stop doing, but you can get, get, because remember the Calvinists believe that if you're once saved, you're always saved. You know, like one of like this guy, Vocab Malone, you know, he said he's a Calvinist too. I think he defend that doctrine. You know what I mean? That once saved, always saved. It's, it's totally Peckerwood Christianity. This is Peckerwood Christianity. It's like everything else the white man does. He'll take it, he'll break it, he'll reinvent it, and he'll make it a whole nother something. And people will forget about what the original thing was. <laughs> you know? So this guy, this guy, the father of, the father, this is their father, like, like Yeshua said. Ye of your father, Hasatan, the devil. Because the devil, devil told us what his game was in the book of Job. Skin for skin. Skin for skin. Why was there racism? Why was there slavery? What did Satan say to Yahweh, to Jehovah? Skin for skin. Skin for skin. You got white skin, you be indentured servant. You know what I mean? You got black skin, you, you a slave for life and not even a neighbor, even if you live right next door. <laughs> this is some wild, yo, know, cognitive, what do you say, cognitive dissonance? Yeah, cognitive dissonance. <laughs> Then we hit um, Exodus 21, 20, 21, 20 to 21. Okay, I think this one, this is the one that talked about the Hebrew, the Hebrew servant. The Hebrew. Yeah, talk about, um, let's see, I got it right here. Hold on, I got it right here. Here we go, here we go. Okay, I think. Um, let me say, if a man strike his sleeve, which verse is that? That's I got I got the chapter. From um, Exodus twenty one verse twenty. Okay, I got it. I got it. 
if a man if a man smite his servant see see another thing brothers and sisters back in jonathan edwards time since he's from the 1700s they were reading like king james bibles they wasn't reading all these little funny bibles today they were reading king james and yet they were going to these areas of of scripture to justify quote slave slavery slavery but the notice you, you don't find that in their 1611 text just this more cognitive dissonance and if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod and he die under his hand he shall surely be punished wait 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 hold on for a moment hold, hold on for a moment this is what they were using to justify what they did to hebrew and black Igbo people african people if a man smite his servant they would say slave or made with a rod and he die under his hand where it says he shall surely be punished oh oh and jonathan edwards christianity means a slave right yeah. the slave is going to be punished right well how dare you die you know how much money i spent on you no but notice this it said that the man that does this so how many slave masters were were jonathan edward christians right they were jonathan edwards christians and they had smit right uh, a, a man or a woman a black man or a woman with a rod with their hand and that one died was any of them ever punished anybody did any research on that how many of them punished the one who the white man who who owned a, a black human being and killed him with a rod how many of them were punished anybody anybody knows how many I mean, they were good Christians, right? They believe in the Bible, right? Jesus loved me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? But remember, Edwards, he didn't like certain, he didn't like certain um, <laughs> rules. Verse 21, notwithstanding, look at this, notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, uh-oh, he shall not be punished, for he is his money, 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 money. Now, the thing I have to say, because you know we're Torah scholars here, so... We, know, we understand the real context. These people are basically, what they call it again, are like um, imposters. White Christianity is an imposter. They made themselves believe that they were Israelites. But how they took these verses, how they, how they reinterpreted these verses, it meant that if they killed a black man or woman that they had enslaved, they would not be punished because it would be like you lost your money. Right? So no way, no what you just read right there, right? They say in Jonathan said was no, they said in the Bible, mistreatment of slaves mm. is a serious violation. Who, who, who said that? Jonathan Edwards didn't seem concerned about that in a culture where slave abuse and murder was commonplace. Mm. So you were just asking a question a while ago about how many of these um, slave owners were punished. Get, get any punishment or any type of charge for the abuse, the not even the, the abuse, the murdering and killing of the slaves. Oh, because they lived in a violent. That's why they try to say he was a man of his time. I, 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 I thought he was really a man of God or, 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 or this angry God. Well, yeah, he is a man of the angry God. Well, we're going to get to where he is just now there. Okay. <laughs> Let me stay in the same chapter, but hit um, Exodus 21, but hit, no, uh, but hit 7, hit verse 7. Okay, uh, verse 7, we're in 21? Yeah, see, yeah, yeah same chapter. Okay, here we go, verse 7, verse 7. And if a man sell his daughter to be a maid servant, she shall not go out as the men servants do. Go on. Yeah. If she please not her master, who hath betrothed her to himself, who has um, engaged her to be married to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her to a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. And if he hath betrothed her to his son, 
that means like engage her to be married right to his son he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters if he take him another wife her food her raiment and her duty of marriage shall not diminish and if he do not these three to her then shall she go out free without money he that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death word word <laughs> oh oh but then they didn't consider black men men you, you remember that you remember no, that trick remember i just said it they had a culture of slave abuse and murder was commonplace in daytime but how do they justify it to themselves? Because remember they said black men were three fourths or something? Like it took like three of us or, or, or four or five to make one of them? Three fifths of a human being. Yeah, yeah. So so therefore that's another way. You see how they have these slick, diabolical, satanistic kind of um, excuses? Because they didn't view us as neighbors. They didn't view us as a man. So somebody point out this verse. Hey, why you killed that, that, that slave? He, the Bible says he that smiled for man so that he dies should surely be put to death the first thing they'll say is that the slave is not on the same level of being a man as a so-called white man no um let me hit Nehemiah. Ne Nehemiah chapter one nehemiah yeah chapter one verse one nehemiah they said the words of nehemiah here we go here we go right here nehemiah the words of nehemiah the son of um hakalia or was it hakalia the words of hakalia hakalia and it came to pass in the month kislo in the 20th year and i was in shushan the palace go on Right yeah, this is a good section here. Yeah, I want to see if this connects with this reasoning. I'd like to go see. Ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, verse two. It says, and and um, Hanani, and Hanani, one of my brethren came. He and certain men of Yehuda, and I asked him concerning the the Yehudim, the the Jews that had escaped which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. You know, captivity is also a old word that if they want to replace words, you could say of the slavery, right? And they said to me, the remnant that are left of the slavery, I mean captivity, thee and the province are in great affliction and reproaches. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the Elohim of heaven. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord, Yahweh, the Elohim of heaven, the great and terrible El, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, or should we say slave, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the Bnei Yisrael, the children, the sons of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moshe remember I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moshe saying if y'all transgress I will scatter you abroad among the nations he's gonna scatter us far to far nations huh but if he turn to I and keep my commandments and do them though there were of you cast out to the uttermost parts of the heaven that's like from africa all the way to this americas yet will i gather thee from thence and will bring them to the place that i have chosen 
to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and with thy strong hand. O Adonai, I beseech the eye. Make now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servants and the prayer of thy servants who desire to, to, re to respect thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man for I was the king's cup bearer. That's Nehemiah, first chapter. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No. Well, he back to the head was here again. The reason I wanted to read them, them to the, um, the one in Exodus and Nehemiah. Wait, 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 wait. Jonathan Edwards is not going to talk on this, is he? No. He's not going to talk on it, but we're going to expose him on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's not exposing right here. So now it says here, um, in the Old Testament, slavery isn't keyed into race. Say it again. In the Old Testament, slavery is not keyed into race. I mean, race is not a factor. Good point. Mm -hmm. In slavery, mm. in the Old Testament. If Edwards believed in following the Old Testament law, then mm. white people could also be enslaved. He or his children could be sold. Mm. The um, Minkima says here that the reality is that he didn't is you know he said the reality is he hadn't believed in the Bible in like in the Bible at all. He was using reference very selectively mm. to create a rule of white supremacy. Boom. I'm gonna read that again. The reality is that he hadn't believed in the Bible at all. He was using a reference very selectively to create a rule of white supremacy. Mm. For that would last a hundred years, remember that? A hundred years. A whole century. <clears throat> Does the Jonathan Edward did in fact know better. He knew slavery was a sin. Many were telling him and other pastors, it was wrong. Mm. Hmm. Now, here you talk about the Civil War. He said, after the Civil War, it's another bullet point here, after the Civil War, Edwards' slavery advocacy was erased. Mm. And he's held on to his, his phony baloney Christianity. That's what they did. Mm. Said, that subject has been little discussed. I wrote to Kenneth P. Minkama, Minkama and he kindly replied about the slavery reference disappoint, um, disappearing, he writes. It seems the image of Jonathan Edwards as a model of Christ, Christian thinking and living led to a <laughs> willful ignorance of the reality or at least an unwillingness to confront the ramifications of it. Mm, the consequences, yep. Mm -hmm. Does it prompt a rereading of Edwards as a theologian? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a big word there. He's he's one of their top theologians. He's like the best of them. You know, he's like the best of them. He, he, he is the best of them. Like you said, after the Civil War, they erased all of his slavery involvement. They, they whitewashed. That's what they did. They whitewashed his slavery advocacy. 
you know, from the public. But notice this, from the public, but the evidence is still there. Like like what um, Kenneth um, P. Uh, um, Minkema, what he found out. You know, Jonathan Edwards on slavery and the slave trade reveal a secret, the religion, the religion had kept for centuries. And we're talking about white Christianity. Let's not take it away out of context. Let's keep it in the context. This modern day evangelicalism, evil angelicalism, revealed a secret religion. The religion had kept for centuries. Notice, it didn't say for a century. Bruh, you know, it didn't say for a century. Century. You know, like I say, I say I lost hundreds of dollars. I didn't say I lost a hundred dollars. Hundreds. A hundred. That means that means more than one. About the man often called, what's that? Father of evil angelism. Father of evil angelism. Because this guy needs to be exposed. Because he's still the one I'm sure a lot of these evangelicals out there have been reading this guy's work. Well, how do I know that? Because they preach the same garbage that he preaches. Even when he preaches from the pulpit as a theologian, it's fraudulent. Just, just on the fact that it is not what the Bible says. In other words, he has this fault over here, right? Not obeying the rules concerning slavery or enslavement of black people and how he was looking at black people and how others, he became the leading spokesman. Now they want to hold to his religious theology. I say this, what he's preaching in that false doctrine is 10 times worse than the worst things that they did and, and his things did to black people. I, I hate to say it like this because on that level, you know, it's getting to the real soul of the matter of who this Jonathan Edwards really is. And bro, I can't really hold this anymore. I gotta, I, I gotta, I, I gotta share this right here. Right, I gotta share this right here. We we gotta look up Angel for a moment, right? In the Bible, lose it. huh? Lose it, lose it, messenger. Angel, um, transform. Yeah, Transformers. You remember that? Transformers more than meets the eye. Right, Transformers, Luciferians in disguise. Second Corinthians eleven and fourteen, and no marvel for Satan himself. Is transformed into the angel of light. Wait, hold on for a moment. Uh -huh. Satan, right? The word that he calls Satan, Satanus, mean the adversary, one who opposes another in purpose or act. So a Satan or Satanus is anyone who opposes, like an op, like an opposition, right? The prince of the evil spirits, you know, he's an, inver an inveterate adversary of God and Christ. Now, on the slavery matters, we know that he opposed the word of God, even though he was preaching the word of God. He didn't like those things. He took liberties to erase certain things and go against what he clearly could read and understand. He incites apostasy from God to, and to sin, right? Circumventing men by his wiles, right? So right here, just to give one the uh, idea of who this Satan is, it says, on Christ's return from heaven, he will be bound with chains for a thousand years. But when the thousand years are finished, he will walk the earth. Notice what it said. What it said? It said Satan going to walk the earth. Hold on for a moment. Wait. We're not talking about spirit? Are we talking about spirit? It said he will walk the earth in yet greater power. One don't recognize how powerful this evangelicalism is. <laughs> but shortly after we'll be given over to eternal punishment and a Satan is an angel like a Satan like man a Satan like man right the accuser the devil the slanderer the liar and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an image an angel slicker an angel of light you saw how they transformed his 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 involvement in slavery right after the Civil War Right? They made him the top theologian. He's the father of American Protestantism, of American evangelicalism. This is no small thing, brothers and sisters. This is no small thing, you know what I mean, that he is 
you know, so highly reverenced. You know what I'm saying? So highly reverenced, you know, amongst the white Christians and even black Christians who probably don't even know how how involved he was in what happened to their ancestors. Think about it. The cognitive dissonance. The cognitive. But I hear people telling me about the same his same doctrines. Oh, the angry God. That's an angry God. You know, I heard that something about it didn't really wasn't right because they made God in their own image. That's what they did. They Let made. Me one, one, like what um, what man came out um, add to what he just said. There. I'm gonna ask the question again and then give his um his reasoning. He says um, man came out says, does it prompt a rereading of Edwards as a theologian? Mm. Minkema thinks so. He adds, there's no denying Jonathan Edwards' historical significance in his own time and his profound influence in subsequent centuries. And so he remains a figure who warrants study. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to appropriating his thoughts or recommend recommending his life his views and practices on race and slavery compel a serious reappraisal of a person who could speak so eloquently about the beauty of god and yet held fellow human beings in bondage and use the Bible to justify it. Mm. Of course, and sadly, he was quite typical of the white Protestant of his era. Mm. Say, say that again. <coughs> he was, he was of, of course, and sadly, he was quite typical of the white Protestant of his era. That's why they big him up. Because he's a man just like them. He's like that ideal, the ideal, the ideal man. Galatians 1 and 8 says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, here's the thing that people have to seriously try to get from this. Especially if ones are evangelical and you watch this far and everything. You have to ask yourself, did this Jonathan Edwards, did he not preach another gospel? See, the, to be an evangelical uh, evangelist, like it says in the Bible, is one who goes forward to preach the good news. That's what the, the word literally means. Evangel means good news. Wengel from the Greek. Good news, right? So here in Galatians 1 and 8, it says, But though we or an angel, right? Though we or an angel, right? It says here, from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached. In other words, if what he's preaching in his theological writings, as McKenna says, we should, you know, we look at, analyze him as a theologian, right? What does the word say? That we have preached to you, let him be accursed. The Bible says that. Let him be accursed. So they were preaching about the love of God, right? You know, he, he spoke so-called eloquently about the love of God. But it was a selfish, it was a selfish, it was a man-made religion. It was a man-made religion. You know what I mean? There was no, there was no Holy Spirit in it. In fact, I read some stuff that he wrote and everything. It sounded like a lot of that cornball stuff that sometimes people watch on these religious shows on Sundays. It's, it's, it sounds like the same. If, if you don't know the Bible, it sounds nice. I get it. If you don't know the Bible, it sounds nice. It, it appeals to your feelings and emotion. But if you know the Bible, you every other verse, word, or sentence that they say, you're like, this contradicts what? This contradicts what the Bible's about. So the slavery part of his life that they try to suppress, it's like the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So they hide the tip of the iceberg, right? But how many Titanics have there been? <laughs> you know? 
as we said look, before. Look, 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 what, look, look what Paul says in Galatians 1 and 9. Paul and others saw that there would be a day like this. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel, any other, what they call it? Wengel, Wengel, Evangel, good news. Their good news was a selfish good news, it was a white supremacy good news. Right? God is a white man. They're the children of this God. Right? He's an angry God. Right? Hell and fire and brimstone for everybody, but a life of luxury at the expense of other human beings that they didn't even consider human beings. They didn't even consider them neighbors. That, that point you brought out earlier, bro, about neighbors. And they didn't consider themselves neighbor. It was... You know, and how far did the slaves, the enslaved black people live from them? They live right up in their house, everything, you know what I'm saying? They live right in his house. Right there, you see them every day. And and he's not a neighbor. No, if I see you every day, how you be my neighbor? But, and not a brother either, not even a human being, you know? Nope. And, and here's the thing that even even my wife, he one time, you know, if you talking about reasonments, and, you know, we reason on it, something that she says, I'm not, I'm not quoting her exactly, but it's like they... Took, took black people as like animals, but still would have sex with them. Think about it. Think about the mindset for a moment. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You know, like that girl that you don't even view her as a woman. You view her as some animal. She's subhuman, but you have a desire to have sex with this subhuman. What does that say about you? <laughs> a messed up type of thing, to show you the truth. And then he's going to turn around and tell you some blah, blah, blah about his God or, or, or his Antichrist. What, what, what Yeshua said, they shall come in my name, right? He says, many shall come in my name and say they are Christ. Jonathan Edwards did that. Didn't he come yeah. in the name of Christ, say he's a Christian? By saying you're a Christian means you're, you're, you're a Christ. I'm trying to cover up all he does. It says here, um, modern evangelicals had to try to explain it. Explain it? Explain yeah, what? Yeah, explain his slave owning and his views of racism and all these things. They got to try to explain it. So, so when Jonathan, when, when Edward history as a slave owner would come up, there'd be a lot of sign, a lot of sign that everyone is full of sin, etc. Oh, oh, yo, 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 you just hit it. That's what they do. That's what they do. That's what they do, that guilt trip. That Christianity, that Christianity guilt trip right there. Read that over again. Word. When, when they you bring see, when Edward's <laughs> history as a slave owner would come up, there'd be a lot of signs oh, that, oh. that everyone is full of sin, etc. He goes to say it was it was tricky to say more. To to conceal one evangelical leader for even virulent racist, racism could lead to the whole religion being in danger. Mm. The great, the great, the great um, Protestant founder, John Calvin, had known of the modern slavery in Africa, um, of Africans. He could see, he could see discourage it but let the door open <laughs> to its necessity oh necessity they had to do it so it's necessity they had to do it they had no choice they had to do it mm. Mm. The, um, the founder of the Moverian church Nicholas Van Zin Zendorf held that God had punished the first Negroes with slavery. Hmm. Such talk was common. Such talk? Yeah, such talk was common. That God punished we so they have a right to do what they want to we because God ordained it, he punished we so. They, so they could do what they want with us. Oh, because that was the other lie they told. That's, that, that's where it connects with the whole lie of the, the curse of Ham. Yeah. When the Bible says nothing, I'm so happy I've heard some people talking about this and many people are picking up on it, that the Bible didn't say nothing about Ham being cursed. So notice what they do. 
they will have the Bible in hand and people will be reading the Bible and they will change the words on the page. People are reading the words on the page and they'll change the words on the page. They'll say that Ham is the black man. Notice what kind of foolishness is this. You have Noah, according to the Bible, he has three sons. How in the world is one going to be <laughs> and one going to be, right? So how they flip it, how they flip it right here, a couple of, of man-made religions, right? Just, just on this right here, man-made religions, right? You had John Smith, right? He created the Baptist religion. Did you know? The Baptist religion, right? Um, here we're touching on Jonathan Edwards and his accomplices, right? What do they call it? Accomplice after the fact? You, you heard about that in law, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I did a crime, but then you come along later on. You was a part of it, but they might catch you up too. Because they say you accomplice. Well, here's his accomplices after the fact. You rob, no, like you rob the bank. <laughs> I find out you rob the bank. I get some of the money and I go and, you know, I catch with money now. Accomplice after the fact. And, and maybe you don't even have to get no money. I could rob the bank and I'm in the car that I robbed the bank in and. You know, you're walking down the street, I honk the horn, and you come to sit down and talk with me, and the police roll up. And you said, no, I just stopped to just say what's up to him. They didn't want to hear that. They, they said, no, you was, you, you're part of the robbery. That these guys are part of the robbery. Look at this. The Baptist religion was the religion of the South. Most of the plantation owners in the South, many of them, the South, the Southern states, they were Baptists. The only Christians that I know about, so-called white Christians, that wasn't knee deep in it were like maybe the Amish with some of the Amish you know they didn't really fight against it but they didn't partake in it they kind yeah. of did, did their own work and later on some of them helped out a little bit with the railroad you know the underground railroad but John John Smith with a Y not an I right he created the Baptist religion in 1608 Charles Parham Guess what? He created the Pentecostal religion in 1901. I know a lot of us, I've, I grew up around ones who were the Pentecostals. Of course, they were black Pentecostal. You know, we'll try to put on the so-called blackface, right? There was Joseph Smith with an eye. He created the Mormon religion in 1830. Charles Taze Russell is said to have created the Jehovah Witness religion in 1872. And then we have William Miller. He created the Seven-Day Adventist religion in 1863. But they are all indebted. They are all indebted to Mr. Jonathan Edwards, the founder of evangelicalism. Because in a sense, all of them are evangelicals. Right? They're all about this new white Anglo-Saxon Protestant gospel. Second, um, Colossians 2 and 8 says this. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Be aware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. It's a shame because many of these ones and ones with uh, the white um, evangelical, evil angelicalism, they didn't even pick up on this. They must have read this verse in the Bible a whole lot. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Right, so they, they call him a theologian. I say these are philosophy, feel out softly, devil's philosophy. Give us a teach him his magic. We don't want the devil's philosophy, vain deceit. After the tradition of men, what they say, he was a man of his time, right? We shouldn't blame him so much, right? But a lot of violence. The tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, what was going on? Because slavery had gone on in Africa, they say, right? And ham or whatever, like that. So, therefore. They had a, a what? Necessity. They justified it like it was a, a necessity. It was like they were possessed. That's not like somebody being possessed and doing something and saying, I couldn't help myself. I can control myself. You said, why do you do it? Can you stop yourself? No, I, I, I needed to do it. Right? After the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. Not after Christ. You know, not after Christ. Just want to point out some of these accomplices. You know, because if you're in any one of these doctrines, I'm not saying there might not be anything that the spirit of truth will teach you. 
but you have to flee from these ones. You know what I mean? These are like the spawn, the spawn of Satan. <laughs> you. you know. This one, um, let me go ahead. I say it says um, this guy named George, George Whitefield. He just spoke about um, the, like the black face, right? Whitefield. Says, <laughs> this guy, this guy, George, George, George Whitefield, mm. a, a prominent preacher in colonial America, told slaves. Their hearts were as black as their faces. How, how, did he see that? How did he know? <laughs> he, he could see right through their chest. That he told he told the enslaved black folks that our hearts were as black as our faces. faces. So, remember why I said skin? For, hold on for a moment, bro. You know <laughs> that's another verse right here, right? One okay. And as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel to you, then that y'all receive, let him be a curse. These guys are a curse. This guy, George, what, what, what's his last name again? Whitefield. Whitefield. George Whitefield, he told enslaved Africans and black folks that their heart was as... Black as their face. Black as their face. So that means that he believed, you know what I mean? He believed that because his face was white, right? Because his face was white. Okay, hold on for a moment. Because his face was white, that his heart was white. And here I want to share with you something right here. You know, let's get this boy Satan right here for a moment, right? Because that's the... That's their leader. That was their father, right? Like when Yeshua said to those Pharisees that they are of, you know, Satan, their father. Job 2 and 4. And Satan answered Yahweh, Jehovah, and said, skin for skin. See, this guy was preaching and saying to the people that their heart was as black as their faces. Now, we know he's a liar. Because if they cut any one of them open, and you know they did, they didn't see a, a black heart. You understand? They saw a heart that, like any other heart, that beat blood, right? Had the pinkest tissues. You know what I mean? The, the, you know, the same thing that every most hearts have. But he's a liar, first of all. But you know why he said that? Because the white supremacy doctrine, that's Satanism. Skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Get that? Skin for skin. So this is why they say that they couldn't help it. They had a need for this. It was, they had to do this because they were being possessed by Satan. White supremacy is Satanism, right? Counterfeit Christianity is the antichrist y'all been hearing about. That's the same antichrist they be telling you in the Bible and they be telling you the antichrist is coming down the road. It's going to be some guy coming along soon. You know what I mean? But they are the antichrist, skin for skin. So you black people, you have black hearts. We white people, we have white hearts. You black people, <laughs> hearts are black and dark and black equals sin. That's how they thought with their, with, their, with their insanity. And because they were white, they had white hearts and they were pure. <laughs> so the red man got a red heart, the yellow man got a yellow heart, and the brown man got a brown heart. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you remember they used to have that white man that pretend to be Fu Manchu or something. Yeah. And there was this whole thing about like yellow, you know, like yellow. They call the, the the Asian the yellow, and they try to make the Asian out to be a coward. You remember back in those racist movies and TV shows, because he was yellow. Because yellow to them was like 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 piss, like somebody pee on themselves, or it was like cowardice. So these these people, when we think about how they thought, who thinks like that? You know, yo, this verse here, Job two and four. We're gonna have to return to this. I just want to let people hear this once again. And Satan answered Yahuwah. He answered Jehovah right here, right? He answered Jehovah, right? Right. The Lord said, the Lord said to Satan, "Hast thou considered my servant Job?" It's like the Lord said to those white Satans. Have you considered my African people? That there is none like him in the earth? 
perfect and upright man, one that feareth, respecteth Elohim and escheweth and hateth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And what did Satan boy answer? And Satan answered Jehovah and said, skin for skin. So they got us caught up on this skin thing. Yo, bro, I was going to do this thing earlier. Hopefully we'll pick up on it. Um, I wrote it down. What is it called? Oh, that black misunderstanding of what black meant to our ancestors. When, when our people started to use black, it never meant our skin. Right? But this is what leads to colorism. You know how a lot. No, 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 no. I don't put it in your ear and in one's and one's ear because you know. Hopefully, the Holy Spirit will show, right, right. Um, but He says what? But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone. Look what Satan is saying. Satan is saying to Jah, to the Lord, to God, to put his hand forward now and touch his bone and his flesh. And he will curse thee to thy face. <laughs> Angry God. You see how that doctrine come up? Sinners in the hand of an angry God. And remember how I showed you that in the like Ethiopic. When they say like Satana Yemetal. My Satan cometh. It means like I'm getting angry. You know so part of that anger was that jealousy too. Because we know there was a lot of jealousy. Over the black man, woman and child. You see what I'm saying? There was a lot of like, there was lust. You know what I mean? There was there was a lot of carnality, but there was a lot of jealousy. So that, that which the white people were not, they demonized. You see what I'm saying? Based on skin. You know what I mean? And they gave everything that they had. They was willing to lose their own souls like the Jonathan Edwards to keep alive something that they knew the Bible spoke against. And Christ spoke against. You know what I'm saying? That's deep right there. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I got something here. I don't. I, I, I like. I, I interested to know. I interested to know if you knew this. Go ahead. The key evangelical study Bible. The Schofield Reference Bible was written by a former Confederate soldier, and he called for slavery. In its pages. In the Schofield Study Bible? That's what it says. It says the key it says the key evangel it said the key evangelical study bible. The Schofield reference Bible was written by a former Confederate soldier and he called for slavery in its pages. Hmm. You know, I've read the Schofield Study Bible, at least the one in the old version, and I like somebody to point that out. You know, one thing I do know is this, that from the Israelite, from our true light and the Israelite perspective, the thing that was is the thing that will be. In other words, that he who leads into captivity, right, must go into captivity. You know what you read earlier about 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 um that based on how they were justifying themselves and what the Bible says, that means the white man, too. Should, yeah, it, should have the same. Yeah, it's subject to slavery. He can yeah. be. And that's what they don't like about the Hebrew and the Israelite doctrine. Because the Israelite doctrine says, all right, deuces. Yeah, y'all got that. We know we understand why y'all got that. Even that, that Nehemiah part, that chapter right there. For ones who can pick up on that, that kind of explains our captivity, our slavery. You know what I mean? But he who kills with the sword, what the Bible say, must be killed by the sword. He who lead into captivity or he who lead in, this is the Bible. He who lead into slavery. Now show me one time, right, that one can prove to me when black folks took white people into slavery. Can, can, uh, I, I'll wait. Can anybody show me one time? So there is a, a slavery. This is, uh, I know, hard for a lot of people to, you know, maybe it's not called slavery, but there's a captivity, as the Bible says, right, for right, the seed of these ones and ones. There, it, it is. But the Schofield Study Bible, no, I didn't know about that one. I, I, if that's in the article, send that to me. I definitely will look into that. 
You know? But did it say... Yeah, I think I'm going to finish with it here. Let me, uh, let me go ahead. Here. It says, um, it goes on here to says, um, but some key Christian leaders had protested slavery. John Wesley, the Anglican cleric and founder of Methodism, wrote in 1787, Ever since I heard of it first, I felt a perfect desitation for the horrid slave trade. Mm. The question asks, how had Wesley been different? Mm. I, I, I sit reading about slavery and Jonathan Edwards Day. Charles, Charles Wesley, John's brother, traveled in America in 1736. He heard of the cruelty of masters towards their Negroes and, and pursued accounts of it. He wrote in his diary, The giving a child a slave of its own age. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> can't, can't make that up. Wow. <laughs> that's that's mm. that's crazy. Mm. I that didn't mean, read that before. That, that just I just read that and it hit me like crazy. Yo, the, the, those those pictures. You probably seen those pictures where there's like some some so called white Anglo child that has. I, I, I knew that, you know, but just I knew that, but just reading it there, just yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it hit me too, like bro. Paint a picture, you know, paint a picture, it, it, you know, giving a child a slave of their own age. Wow. You know, that's that deep right there. You wow, know? wow. And giving a child a slave of its own age to trinitize over, to beat and abuse wow. out of sport. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. What I myself what, what I myself saw a common practice. Mm, a common this is practice. A common practice. That's Wesley, right? Big up to Wesley. Yeah. Yeah. Wesleyan, yeah. Big up to Wesley. Her no, good things. Mm. No, is it strange that being thus trained up in cruelty, mm. they should afterwards arrive at so great truth, perfection in it that. Mr. Starr, a gentleman I often met at Mr. Lorez, at Mr. Lorez, should, as he himself informed Lorez, first nail up a Negro by the ear, ah. mm. then order him to be whipped in the severest manner and then to have <laughs> scalding water thrown over him so that the poor creature could not stir for four months after. Mm. Another mm. much applauded punishment is drying their slaves' teeth. Mm. Wow. Drawing out their teeth? Drying out their slaves' teeth. That's interesting because they say that um, Washington, he had dentures made from the teeth of black I heard people. that too. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. So one... Colonel Lynch is universally known to have cut off a poor Negro's leg and to kill several of them every year mm. by his barbiturates. Barbiturates? Uh, let's see if I'm saying that right. Barbiturates, B-A-B-A-R-B-A-R-I-T-U-A-T-E-S. Uh, 
B-I-T-I-E-S, barbiturates. Oh, b- b- barbiturates. Barbiturates? Barbiturates, barbiturates, yeah, yeah. okay. Brutal, so yeah. Right. Wicked boy, he was wicked. Barbiturates. Mm. The sadists, a bunch of sadists, man. Yeah, let me read that again. Mm. Since I got the word right now. Um, Connor Lynch is universally known to have cut off a poor Negro's leg and killed several of them every year by his barbiturates. Mm. I shall only mention one more related to me by his by his Swiss gentleman, Mr. Zogenbergler, an eyewitness, Mr. Hill, a dancing master in Charleston. He whipped a she slave mm. so long <laughs> that she fell down at his feet for dead when by the help of a physician she was so far she was so far recovered as to show signs of life he repeated the whipping with Mm. equal rigor and concluded with dropping a hat Ah. sealing wax upon her flesh her crime was overfilling his teacup. Oh my. <laughs> Had Jonathan Edwards wished to give Christians of the time a sense of purpose, he might have started here with the Black Lives Matter protest <laughs> in 2021. Jonathan Edwards' sleeves were, rec- were remembered. Mm. So I guess when in in that time there in 2021 when there was going around the place, I guess this topic came up in some discussion in the Black Lives Matter thing. Oh wow! Yeah, that's it. Jonathan Piper, <coughs> John, excuse me, John Piper had briefly discussed the issue back in 2013 interview, but with an eye turned to Christian racism. He was pressed into a full reply. He was surprised. He reports in a blog post to have learned of Jonathan Edwards owning slaves. He writes, I had read Edwards diligently. He he said he has read Edwards diligently for 20 years. Mm. All of his major works and many sermons and smaller um, treaties, treaties, treaties and letters. Treaties, yeah. Uh, treaties and letters, plus at least three biographies, but had never noticed any suggest any suggesting he owned slaves. <laughs> <laughs> He, he ain't gonna find that. Slave. None, none that's even suggested. He, he, he had invisible. Ask why that would be. He, he, didn't, he doesn't ask why that would be. He ends by suspecting that Edwards had been a kindly Christian doing his <laughs> best to help people. <laughs> Edwards tries to perhaps like to Bogier. rescue. It is. <laughs> This is his thing, you know. He said, Edwards tried perhaps, perhaps. to rescue oh. Venus and Titus and to work for um, for uh, for benefits purpose to assist at um, at risk black children. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yo, yo, I had a hard time saying that. Yo, I got a vibe. That if we stir this up and others join us in talking and exposing this Jonathan Edward, um, that they're gonna come out some movie. You know how they'd be doing, right? <laughs> They'll come out some movie, it'd be like a well, Disney, a yeah, like a, a Disney movie or like ABC Disney, you know, movie with him as some kindly, you know, like Jonathan Edwards, you know, no, for real, man. These people are desperate to keep this going. You know what I mean? It's like it's like this guy has been like a hidden, like hiding in plain sight. You know what I'm saying? 
And like what you just read there where they try to make all these suppositions because they didn't read nothing. He and said, try it perhaps. You know what? He, he, try it perhaps. Maybe. He tried perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He tried perhaps to help them out, disadvantage black children. You know, he was preaching about them back in his time. Nah, nah, not this guy. Not this guy right here. He is the founder, like I said in that first one, it said, the founder of evil evangelicalism was a white supremacist, Jonathan Edwards, left a horror history. That's the history of the USA, that his religion, I won't put once to get this, his religion, right, tried to conceal the American Protestant system. You know, so if you want to know about America, Babylon, what is it like the, like Sodom and Egypt? It's like Sodom and Egypt. You know, look at the back of the dollar bill, right? This is the American Christianity that they have taken all around the world, you know, and these same ones, evangelicals like the Pat Robinsons, you know, you know, the Pat Robinsons. You know, and all of the... Well, well, since you're going there, let me just finish off. And... <laughs> that, that, that is the last bullet point there. Get it, get it. It says, most evangelical leaders to this day have been openly racist. The great, the great evangelical Dwight L. Moody, Billy Sunday, and <laughs> Billy Graham, all had segregated rallies. Christian colleges and seminars, Dallas Theological Seminary, Bob Jones University, etc., remained white only as long as they could. <laughs> Evangelical churches were segregated. In 1960, Martin Luther King Jr. observed that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour, if not the most segregated hour in Christian America. Mm. Charles Stanley, the Atlanta pastor. Oh, yeah, that guy. Yeah. Mm. Yes, was a noted seg segregationist, according to Encyclopedia of Evangelicalism, which, which, added, which adds... As late as 1970s, he had guards stationed outside the church to keep African Americans out. You, you mean to keep Negroes out? Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay, you brought us from Africa, change our name and everything, confused the hell, the heck out of us. You know? <laughs> oh, that Charles Stanley guy. That's why I remember that guy used to be on TV sometime on Sundays. You know, like, you know, I used to watch anything. I had my own TV, but I couldn't watch that guy. I try to watch him, but something, he, 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 it's like what I said, they transform themselves into an angel of light. You know what I mean? He sounds so nice and everything, but you know when that vibe in you tell you, like, this is a trick. So that means they, they all know about this Jonathan Edwards. They know what kind of guy he really was, but it's like a conspiracy. It's like a white Christian conspiracy. To keep the truth about him, but even in his followers today, they're racist. They're the same old, the same old, same old. Yes. M Martin Luther King witnessed it. You know, that Sunday, can you imagine that? Sunday being the most church, 11 o'clock around them time. Segregated. Most segre se segregated. You know what I mean? It, it's, 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 it's weird. It's almost like even on a plantation, many times the white people right would have their the anglos would have their own thing you know whatever going on and they allow like the so-called blacks or the negroes to do their own thing you know what i'm saying even from then they had this kind of like heckle and jekyll heckle and jekyll christianity that's why they i'm gonna call this one jonathan edwards white white supremacist heckle and jekyll christianity you know because on one hand, if you watch them, they sound like, yeah, they want to go to Africa. You, you always hear them talk about going evangelizing, evil angelizing Africa. Yeah. They go halfway around the world, like Christ said, to make one proselyte, right? A proselyte, like a convert, 
But what did Christ say? The black Christ, Yeshua HaMoshe, he says, but and when you have made him, you have made him like almost like a twofold, a child of hell, than yourself. You know, it's not just that their their Christianity, their evangelicalism has has corrupted them is corrupt and corrupts them. But what happens when one of us get caught up in that? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, where you really believe that this Jonathan Edwards is helping out and helped out disadvantaged enslaved black children. And he didn't have no slaves. Right? And he's the father of evangelicalism. And the majority of these evangelicals, especially the, the major ones, the ones that have a rep, they're racist. It's already proven. You know what I mean? They're racist. You know? And their Christianity is a hypocrisy. It's a hypocrisy. You know, when they say sin is in the hand of an angry God, they're playing God. They're the one playing God because what do you say? He didn't like the rules in the Bible concerning servants or slaves. No, he liked the fact that slavery is in the Old Testament, but he don't like the rules. To free them. <laughs> to, to, to let them go. No. Let, let them live, and then live their own he lives. Kept his, he kept his slaves until he died. And then he willed them to somebody else. So they were still slaves after he died. So he didn't so they didn't even get free as his, at, at his death. Mm. It's interesting. Let me close out the let me close out this last part and this and then we can touch a little something right here. Um he said um that didn't make it into Stanley's twenty sixteen autobiography, Courageous Faith. My story from a life of obedience. Hear that? A life of obedience. So this book, I reflect, has no discussion of race. A startling absent gives, given his time and place. But the evangelicalism, the racism, is concealed in official history. You only see it in, in odd references or archival finds or in silence. Silence. And what they try mm. to do, silence. Silence. That is beautiful at the last word in this in this whole story right here we just think mm. is silence. silence. It is fitting that the last word is silence. Silence. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what they try to do to his racist, white supremacist ideals, philosophies and doctrine mm -hmm. that still goes after, on today after the civil war was to silence it so nobody know about these things so, and then put him up on a pedestal mm-hmm mm-hmm yep yep and you know something on this this poster here that i got for this for this vlog here um this one that says sin is in the hand of an angry god um it's so about he preached this at at um some Enfield, July 8th, 1741, at a time of great awakening. So they credit this guy with some white Anglo-Saxon Protestant awakening and attended with remarkable impressions on many of the hearers. Right? He was the pastor of the Church of Christ in Northampton. Right? And then under sinners in the hand of an angry God on the side, I'm zooming in now. It has Amos chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. The first thing that caught my attention is that, you know, what one of my favorite verses, right, in ministry is Amos 9 and 7. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians or the Negroes, the black people, the Africans? You know what I'm saying? To me, O children of Israel, right? And remember, all these icons, they already knew that the, the, the Christians before them were black people. You know what I mean? They already knew the Israelites before them, right? So they came through this period of time of the Protestant Reformation where they went through the whitewash. They went against the black Madonna and child, you know, allegedly against Catholicism, but against this, these black, this black image, right? And, and, the, and the blacks. Then they started to whitewash it. You know what I mean? You know, like the same ones that were against images, about 50 to 100 years later, they started to create their own images, Basically, what they did is recreate the original black images in white face. You remember what he said that that Whitefield said 
about the guy, you know, the black man's heart, the black people's heart is as is as black as their face. So this has this quote here, Amos 9, verses 2 and 3. It says, though they dig into hell, thence shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Isn't it interesting that America and Russia, but over here, America especially, right? The same country that Jonathan Edwards helped to establish on the racist foundation, they would be going to, to heaven, talking about going to the moon and everything, right? And it says, and though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight. Now this is supposed to be like the Lord speaking in Amos. And though they be hid from my sight. You remember when Adam and them were driven from his sight? Yeah. Almost like the white people were hidden from our sight. He had to go up into Europe, you know. Or hidden from my sight in the bottom of the sea. The bottom of the sea. It says, thence will I command the serpent and he shall bite them. So this is obviously a verse that he must have been using in his preaching about sinners in the hand of an angry God. So the immediate thing I understood is that when we go a couple more verses, right? Let's read on for a moment, right? It says in verse 4, Amos 9 and 4, and though they go into captivity before their enemies, isn't this interesting? See, this is the quote that's connected with his famous sinners in the hand of an angry God. Because they had to preach doom and gloom. Like, in, in you know, of going to hell. Remember the pictures and your skin going to burn up and such and such. This is where a lot of black people believe that it's going to be a pearly white gate and all that. But here, the part he didn't quote, it says, Though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword... And it shall slay them, and I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. What does the racist white man in Christianity tell us? He didn't have a choice, right? I'm beginning to believe that maybe he didn't have a choice. If you understand where I'm going with this, bro. That, that, that he really didn't have a choice. You, you know what I mean? It's like there's a verse in the Bible, one of my favorite verses, it says that evil shall slay the wicked. You see, what they did is that they stirred up evil, right? You know what I mean? You know, but there's a wickedness judgment coming for them. And the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land and it shall melt. Now, a lot of the Hebrew Israelite brothers will say this is the ICBM and nuclear, nuclear missiles. You know, when Russia and America go at it, it could be. Or it could be the sun changing its orbit and coming down several degrees closer to the earth <laughs> it could be that too and all that dwell therein shall mourn and it shall rise up holy like a flood and shall be drowned as by the flood of egypt remember we had touched on egypt earlier verse six it says it is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven and hath founded his troop in the earth look what the white man has done the white man has tried to be like God. He wanted, he's going up into heaven, have his satellites up there, trying to go conquer the, the, the planets or whatever. And on the earth, he has his troops. The American troops are almost in every country. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? At least uh, not, not the Russian com co countries, but okay. almost every other people. country. Just, they're nothing. But they're just about 90% like, like of the earth they cover. That's why they have the 24-hour military time. So they can police the daylight time and the nighttime time, almost like God, right? He has his troops founded in the earth, right? So he is talking about the Almighty, but here you're seeing these people that have read his word and now have put themselves in the place of God. He Remember how it says the Antichrist, the whole thing in, in um, Thessalonians? It says he who sits in the temple of God, calling himself God, this is them. He that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. Now this is speaking of Yahuwah Shemo, that Jehovah is his name. Here we go right here. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians to me, O children of Israel? Here's my question. I wonder what their ideas was when they came across verses like this. 
You know when it says, are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians to me, O children of Israel? You know, because they know what the Greeks said. You know, everything south of, you know, south of North Africa was basically called Ethiopia by the Greeks. You know what I mean? So like when we get into like even South Africa, actually Ethiopia also applies from the ancient time of the Greeks to the South Africans. Remember the Nile come from south to north. But here it says, saith the Lord, have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt? Remember, initially when they brought black people over here, they did not want to teach them anything other than to slave. They didn't want to teach them more than they needed. And they definitely didn't want no Negroes up reading the Bible. You remember that? See, see, people say the white man gave us the Bible. No, not really. Black people started to take the Bible and read it for themselves. And they started to get killed, beat, you know, eyes poked out, hands cut off for that. And then later on, after several generations of enslaving, you know, enslaving the parents, enslaving the children, you know, after a while, even the dog, when you, you know, you remember that Pavolian, the dog thing where they'd be torturing the dog and they'd be torturing animals, you know, like on the, on the Ferris wheel and the rats and everything. Yeah. And if you keep torturing them after a while, even the animals that have instinct, they can change their instinct. So enough torture over enough generations would make the people forget. And the Philistines from Kaftor and the Syrians from Kir. Here is the verse I want to get to. I know I always go to Amos 9 and 7. Let's connect Jonathan Edwards' angry God with Amos 9 and 8. Behold, the eyes of Adonai, Yahweh, Adonai, Jehovah are upon the sinful kingdom. Upon the sinful what? The sinful government. Right? And I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. For lo, look, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel, the Beta Israel, that's Beta Israel in them heart, Bait Israel, among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Right? So it says, all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. Because we won't be keeping a buck. We as, as Israel, you know, we went away from our way. And in a sense, we left the door open for this judgment, right? I know it's a hard pill to swallow, but let's seal up on 9-11. Let's just seal up right here with 9-11, right? Amos 9-11. In that day will I raise the tabernacle of David, since we're in the time of tabernacles, the sukkah, the tabernacle of David, right, that is fallen, and close the breaches thereof. I and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm going to pause right here, here, here. Just I wanted just to share some good news, you know, after those centuries of bad news. You know, but they knew what the truth was. They know what the truth is. You know, they're good at hiding. Hiding, yeah. You know, they're good at hiding. It doesn't say that about 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 the, the the cherub in the garden. It says, "And you are the anointed cherub that hideth yourself." It says, "You are the anointed cherub that hideth yeah, yourself." You know what I mean? That they're hiding in plain sight, and they also are anointed. You say, "Well, how is the white man anointed?" Wasn't these guys calling themselves Christian? <laughs> there you go. Wasn't it called? And what does Christos mean? It means anointed, right? Yes. The anointed like the cherub, right? You know, I remember the cherub. The cherub were the ones that were put to guard the way of the Garden of Eden, according to the Bible, and they had a two-edged sword. Mm, right? The white man got a two-edged sword, too. He has a sword sword, the gun sword nowadays, the sword sword then, and he got this religion game. <laughs> he got his religion. That's why his majesty says, from truth alone are born liberty. Just the words of his majesty here, sealing it up. From truth alone are born liberty. And only an educated people can consider itself as really free, as really free. And master of his fate. How long has 
has it taken most of us to really find out who their father was? I mean, we know their father is Satan, but their father, Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he's a key man. He, he's a key man. He's the one that they call their father, as we call the King of Kings, our God Father. This one is a key man. He's a key man. You know what I mean? And he's hiding. He was hiding in plain sight. You know? The founder of evangelicalism has some dirty secrets. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We're going to touch on a little bit more because there's that other article. Is that other article we, we we pick up on? I think right here we're, we're about into the one twenty, almost one thirty minute mark right here. You know? Yeah, because I got another article right there with me. <laughs> no, no, I gotta get a, I gotta get a couple of more. I gotta do a couple more search to you know get yeah. some some more graphics. I gotta go over that article and get some graphics appropriate because we have to really, you know, um, show ones the, the the reality of this. Why? This is still relevant today. Why it's very relevant? Because you hear about the 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 e evangelicalists. They're the ones who are setting the whole agenda. They've been setting the agenda. Well, how about Trump? Could be the first Trump. Might as well be the last, right? Yeah, Trump. But that's but that's the whole thing. The, his his biggest supporters is the evangelicals. Is the evil angels? He got the angels. You know. You remember Lincoln? Remember what Lincoln said before they shot him? He talked some speech, people probably know to call it better, the angels of our better nature or something like that. Mm. He talked something about the angels of his better nature and they shot him. Because they didn't want Lincoln, you know what I mean, with his little bit of Negro. You understand, they wanted the Jonathan Edwards. They wanted to be in plain sight, you know, because as long as they, they, they told us about slavery, we knew we were enslaved. But once they start talking about slavery, and guess what they started to preach? They saw the preachers pie in the sky shite. Think about it. They saw the preacher pie in the sky to the Negroes. Right? Getting them caught up in Jonathan Edwards' religion. Right? While they were living the life of luxury on the earth. Think about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait for us in the grave. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we're getting the pie in the sky. And, and some black people began to think because the skin for skin thing is deep, they thought there'd be an honorary white man. Like if they lived a good life. You know, like obedient to Masa, you know, on earth, that somehow Masa would take away their skin. You know what I mean? And therefore the skin was associated with sin. They flipped the they flipped it 180 degrees. It's like the serpent in the garden, man. It's like the whole garden thing again. They flipped it. They flipped it. There's one thing I wanted to do on the closeout. I didn't think it was quite appropriate, right? But it was about, um, it was a little something that the founding fathers had said about Christianity. Right? Just on the outro right here. And it's some harsh stuff to show what, what some of the white Christians actually, not Christian, but some of the leaders of America. Thomas Jefferson says this. He said, Christianity neither is nor ever was a part of the common law. He says, Christianity, Christianity is the most perverted system that ever shone on man. Now, remember when they say Christianity, they're basically speaking about white Christianity. But what, what, what did Christ say? When the devil speak a lie or he speaks something, he's speaking of his own. Because no, they're not saying nothing about us, right? Whoa. Religions are all alike founded upon fables and mythologies. This is what Thomas Jefferson believed. These are the founding fathers. But I could understand on a level of realismism that if you knew about Jonathan Edwards, what he really was about and his kind, his clique of evil angels, one might be a little more secular. I'm not saying that secular is the only route to go. We have to balance, you know, the spiritual and the material in the reality, carry our cross. But I could understand, you know, some of the ones who might say on a level that they're atheists. Because to this Christianity of the white man, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in their God because their God is the devil. John Adams says this. He said, the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. John Adams, one of the early presidents, he says that the government of the United States of America is not in any sense 
founded on the Christian religion. The United States is not a Christian nation any more than it is a Jewish or a Mohammedan nation. But what do they always like to tell us? It's a talk with a Christian nation. Oh, it's the USA. It's a Christian nation. It's a Christian no, nation. Not. But the founding father, like Thomas Jefferson, the one who wrote the Constitution, we have Constitution and Right, blah, 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 blah. John Adams. One more, Thomas Paine, that English, that English devil, but he says some interesting things. This is their view. This is some of the white people's view, white men's view on the Bible, right? Whenever we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel or torturous executions, the unrelenting vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled. What Bible? Is he reading the Satan Bible? What Bible is he? You know, it would be more consistent that we call it the word of a demon than the word of God. He must be talking about Jonathan Edwards here, right? It has served to corrupt and brutalize mankind. But this is exactly what Christianity has become in the hands of of the wasp, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. James Madison, lastly but leastly, he says religion and government will both exist in greater purity the less they are mixed together. <laughs> he said that religion and government will both exist in greater purity the less they are mixed together. Sounds a little like what the King of Kings said, that your religion is your personal thing but the country is for all he goes on james madison says the purpose of separation of church and state is to keep forever from the shores the ceaseless strife the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of europe with blood for centuries pause these white men came to america in the 1600s right and their greatest mind the founding so-called fathers of this white American country. They were saying the reason why they separated church and state is to keep forever from these shores, th this new country over here, the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe with blood for centuries. So Christianity in the hands of white people was a bloody affair. That's why they have that word bloody. You're bloody this, you're bloody that, you know. For centuries. For centuries. So notice, this is back in the 1600s, 1700s. So for centuries, we have to wind the calendar back to, 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 to what? The, the 900s? You know, back in the other, check this out, in the other millennia, a thousand years. You remember the whole thing about the thousand years? And Satan will be released for another thousand years. All right? I think something happened around 900 to 1,000 that we're not peeping. But I like what James Adams says. James Adams exposed it right here. He basically said that the reason why they separate church from state. Now the evangelicals, the evangelicals want to mix church and state. You get it? They want to mix the church and state because they want to reverse what 1865 and the Civil War did. They want to mix church and state. But it can control the state. Exactly. And then they can move their religion now. They can now empower their religion with the civil authority like the Vatican does. The purpose because historically, anytime the state and the the church mix together, the church are always ruling. The church is all, and we already know what kind of Christianity the white man has. I, I just showed y'all right here four of their greatest minds commenting on the Jonathan Edwards evangelicalism, American Protestantism, right? And they have at this at, at the bottom of this thing it, down here it says, "Damn, damn those pesky facts," you know, like damn those pesky facts, you know, like the, <laughs> you know the facts we brought forward. You know what I mean? That's why they hide this from the record. My brother, my brother, my brother. Um, we're gonna have to we, hopefully y'all willing we return on this one right here. You know what I mean? Because we got to expose this. What, is, what does the Messiah say? Ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free. You know, and they get offended when we say that his majesty like God in the flesh. You know, because we finally get to see true Christianity. You see what I'm saying? And we even can look into Ethiopia and other areas where black people for thousands of years also claim the same quote faith 
but without all this bloodshed, without all this enslavement. I'm not saying that it was a perfect picture, but you don't have them running around, you know what I mean, doing these 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 inhumanities and then trying to justify the Bible and pick and choose Christianity. You know? But yes, my brother. When it comes to religion, anything to do with religion and how you can talk yourself religiously. Ethiopia should be the the um, the template for all religions because you all see you all saw of this one God. Old Ethiopia, I'll say old Ethiopia. Oh yeah, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, there, you yeah, know, yeah, when, yeah. Not, not the snowfangles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, when the Muslims was looking refuge and yeah. Muhammad tell them to go to Ethiopia, there's a kingdom there who have religious tolerance. Mm -hmm. That's the word, religious tolerance. Well, actually, in the Quran, he said that to go to the Kisasian because they are monks and priests. And, like, he was basically saying that they are, like, true in their faith. In other words, they are, like, true, true in their faith. And also, Ethiopians, up to the recent time, had the testimony of being honest people. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, like an honest group of people. You know what I'm saying? Which is kind of interesting. The Muslims testify to that. You know? And even the Greeks go back and testify to that. Concerning not just Ethiopia in the sense of today, but black people. Because you'd be surprised. I want to share this with, you, with the eye another time. There are even some of the blacks in Africa who be running around without much clothing on. But you'd be surprised that many of them have real ancient Christian belief. You know what I mean? You ever see some of the pictures of some of the, some of the blacks in, in Ethiopia? I say the blacks because they, you, you can see how black they are. They don't wear much clothing. But you'll see them with, like, the cross. You know what I mean? It's kind well, of interesting. Too, because of this, they, they, they still have that old ancient African um, family structure to true, where true. the family sits down together and you know, they speak about these things amongst the children them and engage the children in conversation to where they learn these things from small growing up. So by the time they get a certain age, this is regular conversation for them. You know, this is how we, we as African people, you know, were back in the day. You know, oh, it'd true. be a family discussion about certain, not, you know, not even scripture, but, you know, family history and history of your environment, you know, your territory, uh, you know, certain great ones and, you know, so you grew up knowing these stories and these things so that a certain age amongst you and your your, your peers know this is conversation you all be having amongst yourself as teenagers. Mm, you know? Mm, mm. Yo, bro, I think I got the good seal up here. I just found this, man. I had it, I had it on deck. His Majesty from Selected Speeches, December 2nd, 1965, page 137. Just one little line here, powerful. Look up Talawa. His Majesty, the Maha Hala Selassie, let me, let, me, let me put respect on the title. Moa and Bessazem Negeti Yehuda, conquering line the tribe of Judah has prevailed. Gormawi, Kedamawi, Hala Selassie, is Imperial Majesty, Hala Selassie the first. Negusa Negez, Ethiopia, the king of kings of Ethiopia, the king of Israel. He says, perhaps even more shattering to the conscience of the world than the political and economic wars of this age has been the vile, the vile doctrine of racism. Boom. So even more than political warfare or economic warfare of these modern times has been the vile, the disgusting doctrine that, that ones like um, Jonathan Edwards and his clique and his crew, the evil angels were preaching the vile doctrine of racism. Just want to point that out, you know? Yeah, that's how a real Christ man stand, you know what I mean? On the truth, on the word. Mm-hmm. In word and in deed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, yes, sir. We give thanks once again for the listeners and everybody who stay tuned to the end, you know? This is the Honorable Rasai Adonis Tafare, Rasimo, a.k.a. Colonel, just vibes in once again, holding a reasoning, you know, exposing some truths as we, you know, we uncover certain things and 
try to, you know, share the reasoning amongst the people them, you know, these these things we say that they are uh, knowledge is not for you know, for you, you know, knowledge is to share and to enlighten others, you know. So that is the key here in this just vibes and is to share the reasonings that we we'll be having with others so they can, you know, opine on these things as well and probably bring out certain things that we didn't even touch on, you know. Uh-uh. So we give thanks for the listening. And once again, I bless everyone in the name of His Majesty Xavier Kadamaw with Haile. Last day, I salute you when I say Ja. Yeah, that's the fire. Hashem Yeshua. Aye, aye. From truth alone are born liberty, and only an educated people can consider itself as really free and master of its faith. Teaching of Kadamaw with Haile Selassie, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings of Ethiopia, the elect. Of God, Xiavi here. Yes, sir. Give thanks. Aye, aye. Give thanks, Colonel. Give thanks, Rasimo. Just vibes and yes, sir. Rastafari. Shabbat Shalom, my brother. Yes, sir. Salam. Salam. Yes, sir. Salam. Aye, aye.